Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with people I've connected with over the years in the world of arts and entertainment, and today we are doing an episode of The Singers, featuring my guest, Keith Hampshire. Welcome back to the show, Keith. Well, thanks for having me. I'm surprised you remembered. Ah, well, I I, I remember some things. I, uh, I remember special things, and I remember special people, and I guess you're special, Keith. Wonderful. Thank you. I know, that's why I'm they... Humbled. That's why you were on that short bus, I guess. But uh... That's it. <laughs> Me too. Anyway, so Keith, when we spoke last time, we talked about a lot of things about your, your career uh, over the years, and it, was, it has been quite a long and illustrious one, that's for sure. But uh, you primarily have been known as a singer, and you've done some notable things. Aside from your hits on the radio, you also were the OK Blue Jays guy, etc. So... I know that when you were just a wee lad still in England, your mom had you in tap dancing lessons, but at some point you kind of rebelled against that and decided to be a singer, so... No, no, that's not what happened. I didn't rebel. I was a rebellious sort, but I I mean, male dancers meet the most beautiful women. you got to know that. Well, I guess so. Of course, you know, you. I mean, I always look with envy at these male ballerinas who are... Um, never mind. Never mind. So anyway, um, I don't know where she got the idea. I'm going to say that my sister was the dancer. She loved to dance. So my mother would take her to dance lessons, and um, I went along. And the next thing you know, I'm taking dance lessons too. But I mean, I was three, four years old. Hell, what did I know? I just learned to walk. So anyway, that's how the dance thing started. I I never turned my back on it. I mean, we came to Canada. Then... I don't know if my sister still took dance lessons then or not. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Sure well, was. anyway, um, the singing all started because my mother went to church and my father didn't. And so she would take me to church with my sister, Anglican Church in Calgary, Alberta. Anyway, I was a bit of a bugger, I suppose, because they didn't want me in Sunday school anymore. So they said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Hampshire, this boy just doesn't want to cooperate. So she thought, well... I'm in the choir. We'll stick him in the boys' choir, and I can keep an eye on him. So that's what happened. That's how I started singing, thank God. My mom, my mom did that. So anyway, I started singing in the boys' choir. Oh, I looked very angelic and this, that, and the other. And I met some pretty interesting guys. Anyway, the um, next thing you know, they've got me singing solos because, you know, Christmas time comes. It's time for boys' choir to sing, We Three Kings of Orient Are. So, um, you know, each of the different boys would pick a different character to sing. So I was usually, myrrh is mine, it's bitter perfume, breathe the life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in a stone cold tomb. What a wonderful song that is. And anyway, that's sort of how I started singing solo-ish. And the next thing you know, um, I'm doing more and more of that. And then one day I get a call from the the choir master and he says, "Uh, there's been a gentleman who has passed away and he really likes your voice and they've requested you sing at his funeral. Would you consider singing his favorite song at his funeral? And I thought, kind of weird, but okay. So uh, I memorized or I got to know this this hymn that he liked and I show up at the um, funeral home and they stick me at the back, and so I, I mean, I can sort of see the tops of people's heads at the front, and everybody seems really somber and very quiet, and the only person I can sort of have eye contact with is the organist, the accompanist. So anyway, he's, he's playing all these, you know, sorrowful hymns and what have you, and then he sort of nods at me, and I get up, and I walk to the front where there's sort of a railing, and in front of the railing, unbeknownst to me, was an open coffin. And I'd never seen a dead person before, let alone up close. (laughs) But I I managed to get through the hymn. It was a little off-putting. No, it was very off-putting. Anyway, they were pleased, and and, and they actually paid me five bucks to do it. And I thought, oh, there goes my amateur standing. I'm now a professional. I better shape up, you see. Well, anyway, over the years, I sang in two or three different church choirs, and always enjoyed it, always enjoyed the hymns and, and what have you. And, and I did manage to uh, behave after a while. My <laughs> mother didn't have to keep such a close eye on me. But 
then she, well, I guess she started getting serious about my singing. So she um, put me in singing lessons. So I was still a soprano. I was still singing. Stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, I took singing lessons from this wonderful spinster lady named Jessie Cadman in Calgary. And anyway, she thought I was good enough to put in annual competitions at the Jubilee Auditorium. They were put on by the Kiwanis Club, and they were called, um, oh, just a music festival, I suppose. And every year, the adjudicators or the judges or whatever you want to call them would choose certain songs, and you would get up and sing them in front of these judges, and they would grade you on how well you performed the song, you see. And anyway, I did that for um, a few years, and I did okay, I suppose. But uh, while I was there, I met a guy who was the same age as me, and he, he and I were always competing against each other because we were the same age. Anyway, he and I became really good friends while we were doing these, whatchamacallit, these um, competitions, I suppose. Jim Lewis was his name. Anyway, Jimmy and I became good buddies, and what we'd do is we'd get up, we'd sing our song, and then we'd bugger off and run around the um, Jubilee Auditorium playing hide-and-seek or just, you know, generally getting... Being boys, yeah. Yeah, being boys. And then, you know, as the years went by, my voice broke. I never saw or met up with Jim again until many, many years later. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that I made this friend named Jim Lewis. As the years went by... Oh, then the folk music thing happened. So it was the Kingston Trio and the Brothers Four and Peter, Paul, and Mary and, you know, the rooftop singers and all these folk groups started performing, you know, Pete Seeger and whatever. You know, that was all the craze, and that's what we listened to. We listened to these uh, these folk music groups. And anyway, one night, uh, some buddies of mine and I decided to go to this folk music club called the Depression. It was a coffee house. You know, you don't drink coffee. Right. I don't know how these places stayed in business. Can you really make money selling coffee? Yeah, oh, well. Starbucks, I guess. And we'll be right back after this. Anyway, um, we went down one Sunday night, and it's, it's amateur night. So my buddies go to the guy who runs the joint. They say, listen, my buddy here can sing, and he knows some folk songs. Why don't you get him up to sing? So he said, yeah, sure, okay. Tell him to sing three songs, and if the people like you, then uh, get him to sing a couple more. Get him to look over at me, and if you know things are going well, I'll get him to do a couple more. And was, so, this, was this a cappella? Yes, it was a cappella because I've never, ever learned how to play guitar, because I, I've got the right hand, or right brain, left brain curse, or whatever you want to call okay. it, where I just can't get both sides of the brain to work at the same time, or, or what have you. So um, I never did learn to play guitar. So I got up, and I, I sang two or three songs, and did some snappy patter in the middle, and you know, maybe told a couple of lies and a couple of stories. And the next thing you know, the next time we go down to the Depression, the guy says, hey, listen, there's a hoop nanny at Viscount Bennett High School. They want you to come and sing a couple of songs. So next thing you know, I'm going to these high schools and colleges and whatever and get up, sing a couple of tunes and get the crowd frenzied. <laughs> I like to do that. So I was, uh, I guess I was semi-professional, maybe professional. I don't know, because I guess I was getting paid, sort of. Anyway, then one day I'm at school and I run into this guy and he's got the greatest ducktail. I mean, he's blonde hair, ducktail. I mean, he had poof. And I thought, this guy is cool. Anyway, he comes up to me and he says, hey, I hear you're a singer. I said, yeah, sure. He says, no, no, really. He says, um, I got a band and, and we need a singer. You wouldn't consider coming and, uh, you know, sort of doing an audition, would you? I said, sure. What the hell? So I went to his place after school and He's got a couple of other guys there, and we start hacking around, and I think we did Kansas City and walking the dog and, you know, the the real simple old standards. And he said, yeah, yeah, that'll work good. He says, here. And he gave me this um, blue lame jacket with white lapels. 
that came down to my knees. I mean, <laughs> I don't know who the hell it used to fit, but it sure yeah. as hell didn't fit me. Anyway, I went home from this thing, and I, my mom said, so how'd it go? And I said, well, I'm in the band. Look, I got a jacket. <laughs> she laughed her ass off. Anyway, we never did perform anywhere. I don't remember us ever having another practice or audition or whatever. So that was sort of how I became a, a pop singer or a rock singer. Now you and talk I guess about by then my voice is broken. You, you talk yeah. about how you like to get a crowd in a frenzy, and I, I think you know that's <laughs> there's another way to put that. I think it's it's more that you are an entertainer and you have the passion about the singing and you you have a way of interacting with the crowd and i think that's something that is a major factor if you're going to be a successful entertainer successful singer you have to have that i can only speak from my experience and i suppose it helps because i just it's probably partially nerves where i you know was trying to kill time before i started the next song so i would you know tell a story about uh, you know i was out doing my papers on the paper route the other day and a turtle crossed my path and you know that's just stupid shit you know and the next thing you know people are laughing or giggling or i'd be singing a song and i'd say hey why don't you come on join me on this one so we'd all be singing along we'd sing michael row the boat ashore or whatever you know when i say i got people in a frenzy i mean i i don't say i specialize in audience participation but um, I love it. I love it when people get along and sing, because I've got a theory that there's a great number of men who have particularly distinctive voices who could be really good singers if only they tried, but they never bothered trying, so they never, <laughs> they never progressed. I don't know what the word is, but, you know, I've got a feeling that there's a a lot of great singers out there have never sung. Well, that's uh, that's an interesting point about distinctive voices, because if we think about who the most popular singers of all time have been, I mean, from every genre, you look at people like, well, Elvis Presley, Willie Nelson, Neil Young, Steve Perry, you know, they've Nat all... Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole, very distinctive voices. And that's something that, well, you have a distinctive voice. And for years, like? for years, I used to think one of the reasons that I never really made it as far as what I wanted to is that I didn't sound weird enough you know what I mean so or distinctive enough distinctive enough weird. and I looked at it for me I looked at it as I'm too normal <laughs> you know well yeah you're probably well yeah okay <laughs> well maybe you are well but, and I think um, I've progressed from a, that there's, but a lot I think of, that, there's a lot of singers out there that are normal and they do quite well thank you very much well I but think I've right. progressed from the, that the ones that tend to have longevity are the ones that have a distinctive style. I mean, like Joe Cocker. I mean, nobody sounded like Joe Cocker. No. But then you look at Ray Charles. Ray Charles, for years, he made money because he could sound like Nat King Cole. But then one day somebody said, you know, you should sing like yourself. Well, I think that's the point that I was trying to make, is that eventually the successful singers find their own voice. And it took me a long time, like a lifetime to find my own voice. And I think that's a key factor in, in a, being a successful singer, like you say about Ray Charles. You know, there are a lot of people out there that put a lot of time and effort into a tribute act, for example, uh, or yep. being in a, in a top 40 cover band. And you can't really progress when that's what you choose. However, nowadays, it's what most people, when they go out to a, well, I'm, not, a I'm, I'm generalizing here, but I'm, I'm thinking that most people, when they go out to see live entertainment, they want to see something they know. And so these tribute bands are doing really well. Well, they are. I mean, and yeah. some of them are just absolutely incredible. And some of them are uh, suspect, to say the least. Well, you know, one of the most memorable moments in my life as a performer was when I was with a seven-piece show band playing at the Hidden Valley Inn in Huntsville, which was yeah. just down the road from the Deerhurst. And yep. I had uh, Nick Panasico and uh, I can't remember his name, but the, the guy from the Deerhurst booking it. Anyway, they, there were about three or four of them that came into the, the Hidden Valley Inn while I was doing an Elvis medley. And when they told me that they wanted me to sing Elvis, I thought this is either really going to suck or I'm just going to get into the role and make it fun. So I did. I got into it and I did my very best Elvis on stage every night for, I think, four or five song medley. And I don't know which one of them it was that said, 
we've never seen anybody do Elvis like that. You know, and, and that, that was amazing. And I thought, great, I've got these, these record guys in here and they're praising me for doing an Elvis cover, you know? So you, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, exactly. I do a lot of karaoke. I love karaoke because, hey, you got a great band behind you because it's all pre-recorded. <laughs> and B, you've got the words in front of you, so you don't have to worry about remembering the words. All you have to do really is remember the melody. So I do a lot of that. And generally, I try and get people in the audience involved and I'll say so what do you want to hear who's your favorite singer and nine times out of ten sing Elvis and I I'm sorry I've been to the Collingwood Elvis Festival a number of times and I can't do Elvis without doing a parody of Elvis yeah. and to me I went and saw the movie Elvis and the guy was Elvis was a parody of himself and we'll be right back after this I mean, he had, okay, I guess for a time he was certainly distinctive, but I mean, he was, he was doing a parody of himself in the end. He was doing what people expected Elvis to look like Elvis. So I can't do an Elvis song without doing, oh, 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 oh yeah, oh yeah, baby, thank you very much, you know, and you can't, it's just, <laughs> he was so easy to parody. Yeah, I like suppose. I say, when I did it, I just thought you're going to either, this is really going to either suck or you're going to have fun with it. So I got into the role. Like you say, you can't, you can't do Elvis without doing that. No, you're right. You're right. So anyway, um, where was I going with this? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I'm lost. I'm these are all the, lost. These are the fun moments. So you talked about the singing contest and you touched on vocal lessons. Now I'm curious, that was late fifties, early sixties when you took those voice lessons? Yes, I would still be a soprano, so okay. let me see, 45, 55, 60, yeah, so it would be, uh, yeah, early 60s, I would think. Now, do you feel like you really benefited from the voice lessons, or was it more just training yourself? No, I, I think it taught me how to breathe. Okay. It taught me how to breathe and how to um, control what was coming out of my mouth, I suppose. Like, I was talking to another singer the other day about vocal technique and how pe some people can really control what they're doing. And I said, you know, it amazes me, a singer that can control his voice to such an extent that he can hit a note and hold it and either start with vibrato and end flat or start flat and end with vibrato. And if you know what I mean, it's like, you hit a note and you go, ah, uh, at the end. Or you start with the vibrato at the beginning and you go, ah, uh, at the end. So you're, you're controlling your vibrato, supposedly. There's some singers that you go, oh, my God, too much vibrato. Please, please, please put that away. Because that's all they can do is sing like that. Yeah, that's interesting. That's You just reminded me of one of my first bands in high school. I was kind of elected singer or volu volunteered or whatever as singer because nobody else wanted to do it. You were nominated. I was nominated, yeah. And um, I think it might have been because I was the one standing closest to the mic stand or whatever. But I remember the drummer telling me, you know, that, that I had too much vibrato and I didn't really know what to do about it, but I was kind of ticked off. And so I managed to work that out just because I didn't want to be known as that guy. <laughs> 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 but you're right. There's so many, there's, there's people that, and some people have made a career out of that, you know, uh, Ethel Merman, you know, oh, I, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's an example. Like, well, don't get me started on Tiny Tim, but yeah, yeah I get your point. And being able to control that goes a long way. Well, yeah. I mean, there's some fabulous... I was really into a singer named Scott Walker, who was the uh, lead singer with the Walker Brothers. And I really loved the Walker Brothers because of Scott Walker's voice and also because Scott Walker was a baritone. And I'm a baritone. And having sung the Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers, all those terrific English bands and whatever, they were all tenors. And I'm having to screech my lungs out 
to hit these notes that these guys are hitting, boop, no problem. Because I'm a baritone and they were tenors. And it was no problem for them to sing in the higher registers where, for me, it was difficult. But I suppose it helped me um, expand my my range as far as you know, the number of octaves I can sing and things like that. Well, that can, that can go the other way, too. I remember at one point in time when I, I had to take voice lessons after I ran into some trouble with my throat back in the late 70s, early 80s. And I remember, I, and I took voice lessons from uh, Rosemary Burns out of Toronto. Oh, yeah, I've heard and, of her. Yeah, and I, I, oh, no. there was this whole thing about the mask on your face. And I never what? really, I never really got into that. And I felt like if mask? I focused the mask, yeah, feeling the notes on your face, yeah, and, really? uh, yeah. And uh, I won't go into a whole lot of details, but I just felt like that was kind of hurting me it, rather than benefiting me. And one of the things that I've kind of taken as advice, Michelle Wright had a column for a while on singing in, I think it was Canadian musician or something like that. And one of the things that she said was that somebody told her early on, work within your range. So I think it can go both ways. Some people can expand and and other people can't. But I think that one of the things that maybe contributed to your success is you had a strong hand in picking the material that you recorded, right? Bingo. Yeah. And when I talked to Holly Woods from the band Toronto, and I asked her if she had advice for up-and-coming singers, she said, right. So I feel like... When I stopped being a cover guy, I started to kind of elevate my status around southwestern Ontario because I was writing and singing within my wheelhouse. Yeah, yep. She's absolutely right. And that's where the money is. Songwriters are the ones that make the money. You know, people say, oh, you sold a million records. You must have made a lot of money. No, no, because all the money gets tied up in expenses. Like, how much did it cost you to make the record? How much has the record company spent sending you to all these different radio stations or, or, or different places to promote the record and how much have they spent on advertising? Did they buy you a full-page ad in cash box and billboard? You know, things like that. And it all gets eaten up. It all gets eaten up. Unless you're on the road performing, that's where the money is. And you say that a lot of people say, my God, these guys are still on the road after 30 years singing the same songs night after night. And I think, yeah, they're, but for the grace of God, go I. But that's what they have to do. That's how they have to make a living. Because there's very little or there's not a whole lot to be made if you're just a singer. Just a singer. That is so true. Absolutely. And I mean, there's a lot of other elements of the music business that can chew you up and spit you out as well. You know, Keith, it sounds like we're really starting to get into some meat and potatoes here. But I think we're going to have to continue this in part two. So until next time, as we all stay tuned for part two, cheers. Now, here in the meantime for your listening pleasure is Keith Hampshire with Big Time Operator. Enjoy.
Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including recording, editing, guest acquisition, etc. And hey, here's some news. We've just recently joined forces with 519 Magazine, so you can check out my interviews there as well. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a clip from my original composition, The Burn, All Rights Reserved. If you enjoy the show and you'd like to help us keep it going, why don't you click on the Buy Me a Coffee link in the show notes. Hit the like button, subscribe, all that stuff. We really appreciate it. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. And until next time, cheers.